Well, comrades, good evening. Hello, Seattle. Thank you for coming out on such a wretched night. It's, this is like Colorado weather here, but I really appreciate your being here and being at this bookstore, which is a cultural treasure. You know, independent bookstores, like most things independent, like independent media, are under attack, are under assault. And uh, this is a kind of um, an oasis. And I was, as a kid, for me, the public library in New York and the independent bookstores in my neighborhood were, were uh, kind of oases of uh, learning and excitement where, you know, you could walk into a bookstore and flip the pages and, you know, come across, call me Ishmael. Or it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, it was the age of foolishness, it was the age of wisdom. And that discovery was uh, so exciting uh, for me. And so these are precious islands and we need to uh, support them. So, you know, hats off to uh, this wonderful store. Well, this is uh, my 11th book with uh, Noam Chomsky, this uh, remarkable uh, human being. I don't quite know how to describe him because he has uh, just transcended so many different uh, categories. You know, for quite some time, I understand uh, that in parts of Europe, they thought there were two Noam Chomskys. One, one this guy that did linguistics at MIT and this other guy who did politics and was radical and supporting, you know, all kinds of progressive uh, uh, courses. I mean, he is credited with, you know, practically inventing the modern uh, academic discipline of uh, linguistics. Uh, he just turned uh, 89 uh, in December, and uh, he's taken up residence in Tucson, uh, Arizona. And people always ask me, well, how did you get in touch with Chomsky? You know, isn't like, you're not into linguistics or anything like that. And I wrote him a letter. I, I read one of his books uh, around 1980, late 70s, and to my surprise, he wrote back. Uh, you know, usually when you write to famous people, that you know, you get a perfunctory kind of response, or, this, or a secretary sends a, a letter, thank you for your interest, have a nice day, sincerely yours. But here was a personal letter. And so we started up a, a correspondence, and then I suggested, uh, and I'm in Boulder, Colorado at this point, and, uh, apprenticing myself at a community radio station there, KGNU, and I was learning how to do radio. So I pitched the idea of doing an interview uh, with Chomsky, and he readily agreed, and that interview was called uh, Politics and Language. And uh, it's been a, a subject that uh, he and I have both been uh, focusing on uh, for many, many years. As I mentioned, alternative radio is going into its 33rd year, and we've had some, I think, spectacular programs uh, of late, if I can say so uh, immodestly, uh, if, including uh, David K. Johnston on uh, Trump, The Age of Mendacity, uh, Richard Wolff, on num multiple programs with Richard Wolff, uh, with Edward Herman, who recently passed away, uh, James Stanley, uh, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, uh, and uh, many others. So alternative radio is a source, and I, I should also say, uh, acknowledging someone in the audience, Dr. Steven Bezruchka, who is a local treasure who has been featured on alternative radio uh, many, many times, and uh, Dr. Bezruchka is here as well, an ally and a friend. So that first interview actually almost didn't happen uh, with Chomsky because I was a uh, technically inept, and I couldn't get the uh, tape recorder to work properly to do this phone interview from uh, Lexington, where he was living at the time. And uh, I said, you know, it looks like it's not going to happen. And he was so uh, calm and tranquil about it. He said, no problem. When you figure it out, uh, you know, call me back. And fortunately, I did figure it out fairly quickly, did call him back, and that was our very first uh, interview. Uh, Chomsky is not easy to edit precisely because he knows so much and wants to uh, load up 
uh, all of his answers with as, as many uh, facts and uh, you know tidbits and anecdotes uh, as possible. But I think uh, if you look at the, the table of contents of uh, global discontents, uh, we do cover a lot of ground. And first and foremost is an area that he's long been interested in, and that is uh, the Middle East. And so peeling off the layers of propaganda that have just drenched that particular uh, region and has so distorted uh, US views about uh, Arabs, Muslims, uh, Islam, uh, Palestinians. Uh, Chomsky has been a champion for uh, justice and democracy for those peoples and, and for that part of the world. Uh, one chapter is on ISIS, the Kurds, and Turkey. Uh, Turkey right now, which is invading uh, Syria, a clear act of aggression, uh, barely uh, commented upon by um, the US authorities. Uh, and that crisis continues uh, to escalate. But I think one thing that Chomsky cons consistently does is talk about the barrel that produces these uh, distortions and these calamities and these catastrophes, which uh, seem to unfold uh, in, you know, time and time again. Why, asking that particular question, what about the policies that produce these kinds of negative uh, outcomes? And you cannot talk about US foreign policy, I'm sorry, without using the word imperialism. We are an imperial power. We seek to extend our hegemony around the world controlling resources, and also on, the, on that trajectory, controlling human minds. So propaganda is an important part of that process. And no population is more targeted for propaganda than people here in the United States. I mean, Neil Postman, uh, who's written a remarkable book called Amusing Ourselves to Death, uh, says that there's no population on Earth that is more misinformed about uh, international issues uh, than uh, people in the United States. You know, I think the bar is pretty high uh, making that kind of statement, but I think there's a, a good deal of truth there where people have you know, uh, so little access to uh, independent progressive thought. And you know, we live in the age of uh, Newsmax and the Drudge Report and Red State and Breitbart News and Infowars and, of course, uh, Fox, the 24-7 megaphone uh, for the uh, current uh, occupant of the uh, Oval Office. And talking about you know, propaganda, the essence of propaganda is to win over people's minds to very simplistic ideas and to repeat those ideas over and over again. Do you want some historical background? Read Mein Kampf uh, by Adolf Hitler. Uh, read Joseph Goebbels, who was Hitler's uh, propaganda minister. Actually, it was called the Ministry of Popular Enlightenment and Propaganda. That was the official title of Goebbels' uh, ministry. And so you have simplistic slogans repeated over and over again. Build the wall, lock her up, drain the swamp, America first. Um, make America great again, USA, USA. The America first one is, is really kind of uh, interesting uh, and reveals, again, the total lack of um, knowledge of history and, and context. How many of you know that America first was the name of a crypto pro-Nazi fascist movement here in the United States uh, in the 1930s? Just for the radio audience, a handful of hands uh, went up. Yeah, it was led by uh, Charles Lindbergh, who was uh, you know, a great American hero, flew across the Atlantic uh, solo in, in 1927, a great admirer of uh, Adolf Hitler. He visited Germany in 1938. Uh, he admired the Luftwaffe and its accomplishments and warned against uh, the US uh, from uh, entering the war against uh, Germany. So, you know, a little, a little knowledge is a dangerous thing. And so had someone known that, you know, and brought it to the, uh, our own version of Kim Jong-un, uh, then I, you know, you'll notice I'll try and avoid even mentioning uh, his name. But, you know, we are living in Plato's cave. We see the shadows, but we never know 
which shadow belongs to whom. And I think that's the great um, work of uh, Chomsky and what he has contributed uh, to, our, to our understanding of what are the root causes of uh, these policies. So it's, you know, it's, we can all feel very virtuous about, you know, denouncing anyone old enough to remember George W. Bush, a previous president who we made fun of as, you know, inarticulate and mumbling and, you know, didn't, couldn't complete a sentence and, and that kind of thing. Uh, but we don't look at the underlying causes which keeps producing uh, these kinds of uh, political leaders. And the current uh, occupant of the White House is a perfect uh, example of that. And so, you know, to just focus and denounce what is arguably one of the most uh, dangerous presidents uh, in the history of this country who uh, is threatening the world with nuclear annihilation, is plummeting the environment, which is a long-term uh, issue that we have to be paying attention to, uh, appointing people to uh, head up government agencies which are dedicated now to dismantling those agencies. So like someone like uh, Scott Pruitt, uh, head of the Environmental Protection uh, uh, Agency. It's more, which might, perhaps should be named the EDA, the Environmental Destruction uh, Agency. And if you'll notice, when you, if you read these scientific reports, and even in the mainstream media, uh, words like unprecedented, record-breaking, and irreparable are being used with such frequency that they've really lost their clout. You know, they've lost their, their, their um, ability to shock because every day there is a new uh, atrocity, you know, whether it's uh, drilling in the Arctic, whether it's uh, selling off uh, two million acres at, uh, uh, in uh, Utah, the uh, Grand uh, uh, Escalade, Escalante, and uh, uh, Bears Ears, and other natural resources. Everything is up for sale. This is a moment of great danger, and we here uh, need to be actively in resistance. And I think, again, this is something that Chomsky urges everyone to do, not just to think about these issues, but to act upon them. This is not a moment for us to be silent Germans, to look away and pretend, well, you know, I was kind of busy, and you know, I was working two jobs, and I'm way behind in paying off my, student, my daughter's college debt, and, uh, you know, the, and my mother, you know, has just been diagnosed with cancer. I've got, you know, there are all kinds of reasons for you not to get active, but this is a moment where we cannot look away. So I urge whatever you're doing, if you are active in community organizations, uh, to redouble uh, your efforts, and, and I always think of um, Pastor Martin Niemöller. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He was part of the um, anti-Nazi uh, resistance, and uh, he was, by the way, uh, a decorated U-boat officer in World War I. Uh, after the war, perhaps because of what he saw and what he did, uh, he became a pacifist and a Lutheran minister and part of the uh, anti-Nazi resistance. Uh, he was imprisoned uh, at uh, Dachau concentration camp from 1938 to 1945. But uh, he has a, a kind of famous quotation uh, that starts off with, first they came for, maybe some of you are familiar with that. Well, I've kind of uh, updated it, you know, to suit our modern situation, so. Uh, first they came for the Muslims, and I didn't say anything because I wasn't the Muslim. Uh, then they came uh, for the Jews, and I didn't say anything, I wasn't Jew Jewish. Uh, then they came for the trade unionists, again I kept quiet, I wasn't involved in trade unions. Uh, then they came for the socialists and the communists, well I certainly wasn't part of any of those uh, political parties. And then they came for me, and there was no one left. And so. Looking away and pretending that the crisis that we're in is not affecting all of us here in this country, here in this city, uh, is, I think, uh, supremely um, 
puts us all in a very precarious situation. So in whatever community organizations you have here, peace and justice organizations, uh, 350.org, uh, Code Pink, uh, and I'm sure there are others that I haven't mentioned, getting involved right now is absolutely uh, critical. And there's still time, but time is running short. And again, one of those words, one of those terms that come out in every single scientific paper is tipping point. We have reached a tipping point. We have reached the point of no return. Uh, Bill McKibben and others think, you know, we're not quite there yet, but damage is being done to Pachamama. That is very clear. There's an assault on Gaia. There's assault on Mother Nature. You know, if your mother were, were being assaulted, surely you would rush to her aid. Surely you would come to her defense. That's what's required uh, right now. So I think that issue, as well as the issue of, of war and peace, uh, are become absolutely uh, paramount uh, right now. And Chomsky, of course, you know, talks about uh, the media. In fact, uh, terms like uh, manufacturing consent, although originally not his, was kind of made uh, popular uh, by uh, Noam Chomsky and his uh, late uh, collaborator, Edward Herman, a, a great, uh, actually, scholar uh, who they both wrote uh, manufacturing uh, consent uh, together. This particular uh, T-shirt, and I'll hold it up close to the microphone so the radio audience can see, it says, resist corporate media. Uh, and this comes from a community radio station of, in, in Garberville, Redway, California, right uh, in Humboldt County, uh, one of those uh, great community radio stations uh, that we have in this country, like KGNU, which I mentioned uh, in Boulder. You know, and it, it's kind of curious that uh, Seattle, for all its activism, doesn't really have a genuine community radio station that is... Uh, community run that reflects consistently in its programming uh, progressive issues. This might be something uh, for you to work on here uh, in, in Seattle, but there is a network around the country, uh, WORT in Madison, Wisconsin, WMNF in Tampa, the Pacifica Network, they have five stations, uh, and other community radio stations uh, that are doing uh, terrific work. And as Chomsky often points out, he notices the difference in terms of the audience, audience's level of knowledge and the sophistication of questions uh, in these communities that have a good, solid, uh, independent uh, media. So resisting uh, corporate media, I think, is certainly uh, part of our job, but creating alternatives is absolutely essential. So it's, you know, it's good to have a critique, but it's also essential for us to pre present positive uh, alternatives. And again, you know, Chomsky, you know, talking about the media, who like to present themselves as objective, balanced, and free from any bias or agenda. Uh, if you believe that, I've got some property, some bridges in Brooklyn I'd love to sell you. Uh, reality suggests something quite different. The media function as a weapon of mass distraction. Much of what passes as news is sometimes subtle, sometimes crude propaganda. The media are large conglomerates that serve to mobilize support for the special interests that dominate state and corporate power. And the, one of the techniques of the system in perpetuating its own power, of course, is to act as, a, as, an, as an agent of distraction, to get you focused and others on sports and uh, whether who the Seahawks will draft as number one, can the Mariners get into the playoffs, uh, and the general Kardashianization of uh, a lot of the media, where there's this focus on uh, scandals and Hollywood divorces and getting people's attention away from focusing on the things that are oppressing us and who rules America, who controls the country. Uh, and you know, are, to, are we to worry about uh, immigrants and Salvadoran gangs? These are all, again, distractions from the main Bout the main, uh, you know, the main arena of what our, our, where our attention should be focused on, and that is imperial power and corporate-controlled predatory capitalism, which is destroying the planet 
in unprecedented ways. And again, urgent attention is required in these, in these areas. And uh, you know, this, is, um, this happens to be Black History Month. And uh, Angela Davis uh, often quips, you know, we even got the short end of that. You know, it's the, the one month of the year with 28 days. And today happens to be the uh, anniversary of the assassination of uh, Malcolm X. Uh, in a few months, well, on April 4th to be precise, uh, there'll probably be some recognition that it's the uh, 50th anniversary of the uh, assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, we just passed his uh, birth uh, day national celebration in mid uh, January, but it's very curious, and again, how the propaganda system works, is how King has been packaged and sanitized, scrubbed clean from his radical proclivities and uh, radical understanding of race, class, and power, and imperial power, and militarism. Uh, to this, he's frozen on the footsteps of the Lincoln Memorial uh, on that hot August afternoon uh, with his spectacularly poetic I Have a Dream speech. And it's, it's a great work of um, very moving and very biblical in its uh, resonance. But the other Dr. Martin Luther King that evolved uh, after that, particularly uh, being influenced by people like Malcolm X, by Stokely Carmichael, by the Black Panthers, by all of the uh, radical movements that were part of the mid and late 60s and uh, early uh, 70s, that Martin Luther King Jr. is largely obscured and uh, you know, cast in, in the shadows. But we, we have to listen uh, to that King who is so radical who called, and if you read his Riverside Church speech, uh, April 4th, 1967, just a year exactly to the date before he was murdered in Memphis, where he had gone to organize a poor people's uh, strike, organizers went to organize the sanitation in support of the sanitation workers who were on strike, and also was about to go to Washington, D.C. to lead the Poor People's March, organizing people against uh, the Johnson administration. And he said at the time in, in New York at Riverside Church, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today is the United States of America. He could read this speech today, and every time he says the word Vietnam, if you just insert Afghanistan, Syria, Iraq, Somalia, Yemen, Mali, Niger, Pakistan, did I leave anything out? All the countries that the US is uh, engaged in uh, militarily, uh, you would not miss a beat because nothing has fundamentally changed. In fact, uh, the violence has increased. So uh, the other day I was giving a talk in Denver. It was the uh, day after the latest massacre um, in Florida. Uh, it got me to thinking about you know, what are the connections between our government being so violent uh, internationally, deploying troops, having this archipelago of bases everywhere, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of soldiers uh, stationed in, in war zones. Africa right now is being greatly uh, targeted by the US military. They're they're operating in more than 30 countries. This is all happening sub rosa. You know, there's, there's no money for health care, sorry. There's no money to eradicate student loans or provide uh, for free college and uh, university education, as Bernie Sanders was consistently calling for uh, during the uh, 2016 uh, campaign. There's no money for the environment, but there's lots of money for the military industrial complex. And right here, of course, you're the proud owners, not owners, but you know, you're in the shadow of Boeing here. 
You're in the shadow of Fort Lewis. There's a bad joke you know, being made that if Bremerton were an independent state, it would be the fourth or fifth largest nuclear power in the world because of all the Trident submarines uh, with their uh, nuclear weapons. Albuquerque would be third, perhaps, uh, in that listing of um, you know, dangerous uh, states. So the military-industrial complex continues unabated, it's accelerated, uh, you know, and of course this is all to make America great again, flag waving, we have to defend ourselves, and of course the manipulation of language and the use of propaganda is how uh, uh, lots of people are persuaded to support uh, someone like the, you know, occupant of the uh, White House. And uh, Alex Carey was a an Australian sociologist, not terribly well known uh, in the US, but a, a friend of uh, Chomsky's. And uh, he said that the 20th century, and I'll just say the 21st century, has been characterized by three developments of great political importance. The growth of democracy, the growth of corporate power, and the growth of corporate propaganda as a means of protecting corporate power against democracy. So when you think about the inequality that exists here in the country, the soaring uh, rates of uh, poverty. Uh, why, is that, why is that happening? What is it about the American economic pol slash political system that produces those outcomes? What is the connection between the external violence and the internal violence. I mean, have any of you seen uh, any of these videos which are very popular with young people, like they're called Call of Duty, but there's a whole plethora of them, extremely violent. Uh, and I've seen some of the, I've actually sat in on a, a video parlor once and watched these kids, uh, you know, playing uh, with their, with their uh, you know, computers, all of these uh, war games, war games, and, you know, becoming anesthetized, kind of becoming comatose to the outcomes uh, that are produced in terms of killing and violence. So it becomes kind of like a game. I remember uh, Lara Logan, who's an overpaid uh, anchor of 60 Minutes, uh, she did a, a report on um, the drone uh, base in Nevada. And um, she, and it was, this was all done in hushed tones, you know, CBS, you know, 60 Minutes has for the first time gotten exclusive access uh, to this uh, base and we see the, you know, the, the base commander and have an exclusive interview with him. I mean, she was totally in awe. You talk about a, a puff piece, classic uh, kind of sycophancy which uh, the corporate media, you know, excels in, uh, particularly when it comes to matters dealing uh, with the military. And uh, so there she was, and you know, following this guy who had zapped what he thought were a couple of uh, targets uh, in Afghanistan and in Iraq, and then going home uh, at the end of the day and, you know, the kids rushed to the door, hi, daddy, how was your day? And, you know, and, and like everything was just perfectly, uh, you know, wonderful, peachy keen. Uh, that kind of, um, you know, um, indifference to uh, violence has, has created uh, an enormously uh, violent country internally and externally. And again, going back to uh, language. Uh, they, the designated enemies, you know, you're all to be afraid of Iran, North Korea, Syria. These are all, you know, like powerful states that are, you know, probably waiting for you tonight when you go home. They may even, they may even be in your closet. I wouldn't go to sleep if I were you. Uh, you know, very dangerous. Uh, they attack and invade. We defend. We have leaders. They have hardliners. We live in neighborhoods, they live in strongholds. We have brave men and women in uniform, you hear that phrase just repeated ad nauseum. They have terrorists and militants. They are fierce tribals living by ancient tribal codes. We are civilized. We are representatives of Western civil civilizations. We have governments, they have regimes. We defend ourselves honorably. They ambush. They use snipers. They conduct sneak attacks. They use human shields. We carry out surgical strikes. Just tell that 
to all of the Afghans and Pakistanis and the Iraqis who have had their homes uh, targeted by drone attacks, wedding parties, mosques, uh, madarsas, which are uh, seminaries, Muslim uh, sem seminaries, time and time again. Those stories, if they're reported on at all, and now they've become so common that they barely, unless they hit some high number, barely get any uh, media attention at all, buried deep inside the uh, newspapers and uh, magazines. Uh, this reflects, I think, also the racism which is inherent in any imperial policy, which Chomsky talks about uh, quite a bit uh, as well, uh, to denigrate to have worthy and unworthy victims. So you learn all, if an American soldier is killed somewhere on many of these uh, battlefronts, whether it's in Niger or in Pakistan or Afghanistan or Syria or Iraq, you learn all about this person, uh, what his goals were, his family life, the interview with you know, his high school teacher. They become human beings. You identify with them. But who cares about Mumtaz Mahal? Who cares about Wazir Muhammad? Who talks about uh, Akhtari Begum? Those people become invisible. They have no lives. They have no context. And that racism, of course, is so deeply rooted in US culture, in the foundation of US culture, with the destruction of the indigenous population, with the introduction of uh, African Americans as uh, slaves, and with the ongoing uh, racism, which has now uh, blossomed, if, if I could use that term, uh, because uh, it's been given an imprimatur, it's been enabled by a White House uh, that is now um, turning uh, these tropes of propaganda against one another against all of us, dividing uh, the, the society. Uh, we are to be afraid of these, this and that group that is you know, th threatening us. Fear, of course, is exactly uh, playing into the hands of any uh, demagogue. War crimes and war criminals, certainly a topic that uh, Chomsky talks a great deal about, but international law does not apply to the empire. We are exempt from not just moral law, but from international law. So uh, take the, the case now, again, with Iran. Um, some years ago, I wrote a book called uh, Targeting Iran, and we talk a lot about Iran uh, in this book. Uh, the, Iran is a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Uh, the Trump administration, I said the name, but I Qualified it, I qualified it with administration. The White House uh, seeks to withdraw from this uh, agreement that uh, the US signed uh, with the other members of the Security Council as well as Germany. So it's known as the, the P5, the Security Council members uh, and uh, Germany. So this is how um, you know, the leader makes America first, withdrawing from the Iran deal withdrawing from the Paris Accords, defying international law and the overwhelming majority of a public as well as official opinion around the world uh, and recognizing uh, Jerusalem as the capital of uh, Israel uh, in total defiance of international law. But again, international law applies to others. We are exempt. That is a classic uh, technique of imperialism. And, you know, Iran is now, I'm afraid, being targeted again for a possible uh, military attack. Uh, we've had these uh, show and tell, uh, you know, kind of demonstrations with uh, Nikki Haley, the uh, US ambassador to uh, the United Nations, you know, holding up a piece of metal purportedly to be an Iranian piece of an Iranian missile. I mean, don't these people have any memory of Colin Powell in 2003 at the UN, you know, showing this, this, and that, and this is all proof of Saddam Hussein being, uh, you know, um, having weapons of, of mass destruction. And Benjamin Netanyahu, another, you know, wonderful uh, enlightened leader who is under criminal investigation uh, in Israel, uh, also held up a piece of metal the other day saying, you know, this is proof positive of Iranian uh, perfidy. Uh, you notice that 
when the, in the media reports, Iran is always accused of meddling and interfering in the affairs of the Middle East. Uh, where is Iran located, <laughs> by the way? Uh, this is a geography question for Americans. Is it somewhere in between Bolivia and Paraguay? <laughs> and where is the United States located, where it has all of these bases in this region, where it conducts uh, coup d'etats, where it overthrows uh, certain regimes and supports other extremely uh, reactionary regimes like uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, the great leader's you know, favorite country. The first country that he went to visit, by the way, you remember he did that little saber dance? I mean, you're talking about one of the most extreme regimes anywhere in the world, kind of the epicenter of uh, misogyny and patriarchy and a particularly pernicious uh, form of Islam known as Wahhabism. Uh, named after Muhammad Wahab, who was a 17th century, uh, s well, there was no Saudi state then, but a Saudi uh, cleric. Uh, and this was the, you know, the same Wahhabism that was exported with US blessings uh, to Pakistan and Afghanistan uh, in the 1980s. Those of you old enough to remember Ronald Reagan praising these homicidal maniacs and drug traffickers, that is the Afghan Mujahideen, as freedom fighters, as the moral equivalent of the founding fathers. These are the allies that Washington consistently makes uh, with you know, these, these characters around uh, the world and supporting uh, dictatorships in Egypt, first with Mubarak, now totally embracing Sisi uh, in uh, Egypt, uh, and on and on. We need a democratic foreign policy that is rooted in law and justice, and not an imperial aggressive military policy, which is fueling uh, the jihad. I mean, can you imagine, I mean, put yourself in Osama bin Laden's head, if you can, for a moment. I'm, I, what can I do? to bog down the US in multiple wars uh, you know, across mostly the Muslim Middle East, mostly Arabs, Arab countries. And to produce that outcome, you know, I think was you know, the attack uh, on 9-11. And the US fell right into the trap, has basically expanded uh, the so-called war on terror. Uh, now in its, by the way, 17th year, I lectured to uh, you know, junior high school and high school students, and I look out at the audience, and that's all they've known. They've known the United States at war. That's the background soundtrack. That's the you know the kind of the uh, white noise that is given off by the, by the lights here, uh, for for example, and it continues on and on. Meanwhile, back at home, we don't have you know. Look at, look at our transportation system, look at all the things that we desperately need to attend here, to here, uh, but the military pulls away so much of the money. And who profits? We the people? Well, you know, there may be people in this audience that work for Boeing and make, you know, a very handsome salary. But, you know, the, the military industrial complex profits Northrop Grumman and its stockholders and its executives and Lockheed Martin, and Boeing, and United Technologies, and Raytheon, and General Dynamics, and General Electric, and all the other military contract contractors that are making money hand over fist. There's almost an institutional imperative to foment conflict uh, around the world because you can sell more weapons, more conflict, use the weapons, you need upgrades. Now the, the, the US is flogging the F-35, the most expensive airplane ever built. We now have Ford class aircraft carriers coming in at $13 billion a pop. Uh, Zumwalt class destroyers, stealth destroyers. There's not even a discussion about this anywhere in the media about these over, overpriced, useless, uh, weapons of mass destruction. Uh, the Zumwalt class destroyers are costing $4.2 billion a pop, and there are two or three more you know, on the design board uh, that will be produced in the, in the next few years. Again, 
where is the money for our people? Where is the money for education, for health, for the environment, for, all the, for mass transportation? I mean, there's been a, a whole series of catastrophes with uh, Amtrak, with our so-called uh, railroad, it's, I'm hesitant to use the term network, uh, whatever it's called, uh, the train systems here that need uh, a tremendous amount of uh, upgrading. No money for there, plenty of money for the imperial war machine. Now, getting back to Iran and the Iran deal, and this is something that Chomsky talks about to, in great detail, there was a problem with the deal. Let's be honest about it. What was the problem? It was working. Iran was in total compliance with the conditions of the accord. It's not a treaty because it wasn't ratified by Congress. It was an, an accord, an agreement you know, much like the much vaunted uh, Oslo Accords, which accorded the Palestinians oblivion uh, in their struggle for uh, justice and, and peace. Uh, Nikki Haley was dispatched, again, the US ambassador to the UN. She was sent to uh, Vienna, which is where the IAEA is headquartered. That is the International Atomic Energy Agency. That's the agency that monitors uh, those states that are signatories to the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the NPT, of which Iran is a signatory uh, and the US is a signatory as well. They send out inspection teams. She was sent there specifically by the great leader to find dirt on Iran. Well, they must be cheating. They must be developing uh, centrifuges under their Nunvai, you know, which is an Iranian bakery. You know, so while they're making sangek uh, on the street here, underneath there's you know all of this uh, skullduggery going on. You can't trust them after all. You know, they're Orientals and uh, they're Muslims or Muslims as they're called in the media or Muslims, even worse. Uh, and she came back empty-handed. She couldn't find anything. Uh, the UN, the IAEA, sent not one, not two, not three, but eight inspections to Iran to look at what they were doing. And they, find, they found Iran uh, in total compliance. And then Haley came back to New York, you know, kind of uh, shamefully uh, disgraced, if that's uh, uh, even possible. It's interesting that uh, she's being touted by such great intellects as Bill Kristol, uh, a neocon who is now um, kind of critical of the great leader uh, as a possible presidential candidate uh, in uh, 2020. Horrors continue. You know, maybe, maybe, maybe we should practice saying President Pence. You, know, you have to be careful what you wish for. Here you have an American Taliban, a fundamentalist Christian whose misogyny is over the top whose patriarchy is over the top, and you know, that's what's, you know, that's what's you know, right behind uh, the great leader. So you know, there's no disguising the fact, I mean, we are in a pickle. We are in a, you know, a very serious crisis, uh, something I haven't seen since you know, the late 60s uh, when Nixon was running amok. Uh, but you know, looking back on some of the things that Nixon did, uh, Perhaps you know Chomsky is right. He was the last liberal president. You know we have Earth Day, the Clean Water Act, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Clean Air Act. Uh, all of these, the expansion of national parks, all of these, at least domestic issues, uh, were uh, you know carried out by uh, Richard M. Nixon. Of course, you know internationally, uh, he was an out of control. Um, homicidal maniac, given to fits of uh, drinking and wild attacks on Jewish people, which the great Henry Kissinger, Nobel Peace Prize winner, never uttered a word while Nixon was carrying on about uh, Jews and how they controlled everything and wanted you know, only the worst uh, for him. But we, you know, to get back to now the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, there are certain states 
that are not signatories to this treaty. Uh, the U.S., which is, by the way, is in violation of this treaty because it calls for the gradual reduction of nuclear weapons. So what is the great leader proposing now? following in Obama's footsteps, a huge expansion, trillion dollars plus expansion of smart nukes, of usable nukes. These are weapons that cannot be used. These are Armageddon weapons. So what are they thinking? So the US is in violation of the non-proliferation treaty. US allies, India, Israel, and Pakistan, a quasi-ally, but let's say an ally, are all non-signatories to the NPT, but there's not a word about them. And they all have, not only do they have nuclear weapons, they have ballistic missiles to deliver those weapons. They have you know, very uh, highly developed uh, programs of mass destruction. But we're not holding them to account because when you're on the side of the empire, that is to say Washington, you get a permanent get out of jail uh, pass. So again, to come back, you know, to what we need to do, we need to get off of Facebook and into the face of these politicians, be they your, your local legislator, your council people, your senators, whoever it might be, make as much noise as possible. Stop tweeting and get into the streets. That's the kind of activ activism that the times demand. It's not a time for gentle contemplation. Okay, you know, please do read poetry, please do, don't ignore the arts. Arts are very important. But we have to get more involved politically and not wait, you know, carry out this uh, waiting game. And I love uh, Rebecca Solnit, a very thoughtful writer. She says, an optimist thinks everything will be fine no matter what, and that justifies doing nothing. But hopefulness means that we don't know what's going to happen. And in that uncertainty, there is room to act. So there's still room out there for citizen intervention. There's still room for us to inject our energy. You know, like uh, Gramsci, the great Italian Marxist, he used to say that, you know, th this seems to be a monolith, this wall. But if you look closely, there are cracks there. And in every space, you can pour in energy and widen those cracks. Leonard Cohen actually has a song uh, that speaks exactly uh, to that uh, particular thing. He's a great um, uh, musician and artist. I might even have that, that song quote here. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack, a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So we have to, you know, be very skillful. Be like Muhammad Ali advisors. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. You know, and so that's, you know, that we need that agility and nimbleness right now. And we need to create alliances. I know we're all on the, you know, the left here. We're progressive. You know, or we're holier than thou. We're very virtuous. You know, we're, but we also have a history of being very exclusionary. And that, I think, historically has been one of the reasons, there are other reasons, indeed, the right-wing attack and assault on the left and progressives. But internally, we've too much uh, emphasized political purity. Oh, you voted for Bernie Sanders in the primary? I can't talk to you. You eat meat? Oh, horrible. You're not a vegan? What? Can't talk to you. You know, again, it's like that Pastor Niemuller thing. Pretty soon, there's nobody left. You know, so we have to be more ecumenical, more embracing, and find common ground. Do we agree we have a major crisis in this country? Is the, the planet is under assault. It's being plummeted. Are we going to do something about it? Those are areas, and I find this even with uh, right-wing audiences, when you talk about, for example, food. Do you want your kid, or do you want to eat nutritious, wholesome food? Or would you prefer food laden with GMOs and additives and preservatives and artificial dyes and who knows what other chemicals? I mean, the answer is a no-brainer. Everyone says, of course I want my kid to have nutritious food. Of course I want my kid to go to parks that are well-maintained and clean and breathe clean air and drink clean water. These are areas where our openings 
there are apertures that we should, you know, pour our energy in and then expand the conversation into other areas of predatory capitalism and uh, imperialism. But internally, we have had, we, if I can use collectively, have had a history of, of being uh, too intolerant of, you know, others and not embracing. You know, we would want, we want people to be somewhere. We, I want everyone to know who Noam Chomsky and has read all of his books. I want people to know about Antonio Gramsci and what, he, what he's uh, contributed in terms in, 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 in political thought. But most people are not there. So we have to be realistic and, and not be uh, holier than thou, not lecturing people, uh, again, a prominent, uh, I hope I'm not doing that this evening, <laughs> you know, a prominent kind of a leftist uh, characteristic, you know, I know everything, you know nothing, listen to me. You know, I may feel good, you know, doing those, saying those kinds of things, but that's not going to invite you, that's not going to bring you into any kind of uh, uh, circle where we can have a conversation. So, ex you know, expanding those areas of conversation are, you know, absolutely critical. So I think, you know, again, you know, going back to um, Chomsky and focusing on uh, institutions and grassroots activism and the importance of bottom-up activism, that's how social change happens. It doesn't happen when great leaders in Washington wake up or in Olympia wake up some morning and think, oh, I'm, this, this and that policy is wrong. I've got to change this. I've got to you know, support the people and you know, carry out more enlightened policies. It's going to happen because you're out there, because you're putting uh, the pressure on. Look at the remarkable uh, results that a handful of Tea Party activists um, were able to achieve in 2010 by going to those town hall meetings and you know yelling at Nancy Pelosi and yelling at Chuck Schumer and yelling at you know these other relics of the liberal democratic uh, establishment they made a, a huge impact and so you know wherever you can find areas of inter in intervention and don't forget art because as Emma Goldman said art makes ideas felt so if you know if you want to understand how fascism operates you don't have to read Mein Kampf. You can read uh, The Plot Against America by Philip Roth. You can read um, It Can't Happen Here by uh, Sinclair Lewis. Uh, there are all kinds of wonderful books. All the King's Men by Ro Robert uh, Penn Warren. Uh, there's you know book after book that's out there, poetry that is engaging. Uh, Faiz Ahmed Faiz, the great Urdu poet from uh, Pakistan, uh, poems like that. I was just re reading uh, Nazim Hikmet uh, from uh, Turkey, a revolutionary uh, poet. So art also expands our, our consciousness and widens uh, the circle of uh, knowledge and inspiration. We need to be uh, inspired and artists through dance, through theater, you know, if you want to understand capitalism, you, know, you don't have to read Das Kapital. Just, just uh, you know, look at uh, Death of a Salesman by Arthur Miller. Uh, you can see that it's, I think, Dustin, Dustin Hoffman uh, plays Willie Loman. There it is. That's all you need to know about, uh, you know, the capitalist uh, economy and what it does uh, to people. So art, poetry, music, dance, films. If, again, if you want to understand capitalism, Wall Street, Oliver Stone's film. Gordon Gecko, you know, right there. Greed is good. It's all about money. It's all about making profits. It's the only reality. It's the only thing that counts. And if his sequel, actually, Money Never Sleeps, Wall Street Part Two, uh, is also, I think, you know, very incisive in un unpacking the myths of, you know, capitalism. That you know, if you work hard and you know you you get ahead, and those kinds of uh, you know mythologies that so uh, permeate uh, the the U.S. So uh, Chomsky, you know, again, over and over, uh, gives us the tools to decode and decipher uh, the propaganda. It enables us, he enables us you know, to cut through uh, the muck and to see things, but ultimately that's not enough. Okay, you've seen things now, you've, you know, you've decoded the propaganda. It has to be connected with action of some sort. And by the way, you know, if you can't be an activist, writing a check 
is not something to be shameful of. It's a great thing. These organizations need your support. So, you know, whatever, if you, that's what you can do, terrific. Do support, you know, independent, progressive uh, organizations. So I'm going to um, remind you again about uh, poetry and read a couple of things. One is from um, a favorite poet of mine, Marge Piercy. On previous occasions in Seattle, I read her poem, The Low Road from The Moon is Always uh, Female. Uh, this is something of more recent uh, origin. That's worth reading, by the way, The Low Road by Marge Piercy. This is called We Give Up Far Too Easily. Why do people get so discouraged about political action? You take vitamin pills and imagine they'll do something. You don't say I'll never wash the dishes again because they'll just get dirty. We all mumble silly prayers into the air. Oh, please, please don't let me miss the plane. Oh, please, please let him call me back. Inaction certainly will work fine for the overlords who own our work, control our lives, consider us collateral loss in their grand schemes. They only fear masses in motion. A little at a time is the way forward, an unending dance, two steps forward and one and a half back. Sitting on your ass too long makes you one. March Piercy. The greatest Urdu poet of the 20th century, Urdu is the national language of Pakistan, it's also spoken in North India, was Faiz Ahmed Faiz. Uh, it's kind of unusual. His first name and last name is the same, F-A-I. Z, Faiz. Uh, he was born in Sialkot, Punjab in 1911. He died in Lahore in 1984. A towering figure uh, in the world of um, Urdu uh, poetry. He was a trade unionist and proud of it. Uh, he was a journalist and proud of it. He was a communist and proud of it. He was jailed multiple times by many of the military dictators that the United States has supported in Pakistan uh, over the decades, and he was proud of that. And his most famous poem is called Bol. So this, now you'll learn a word in Urdu as well as Hindi, because this is the imperative to speak. And if you go to demonstrations in Pakistan and in India, you'll see placards being held up with these three letters, B-O-L. Bol, speak, and everybody knows the poem. Bol ke lab azad hai tere, bol zaban ab tak tere hai. Speak, your lips are free. Speak, your tongue is still yours. This magnificent body is still yours. Speak, your life is still yours. Speak, there is little time. But little though it is, it is enough time. Enough before the body perishes, before the tongue atrophies. Speak, the truth still lives. Say what you have to say. Speak, your lips are free. Bol, bol, bol. And finally, the great Frederick Douglass, 1857, August 4th, an address on West India emancip emancipation. Douglass was an escaped slave, a leader of the anti-slavery movement in the North. He says, if there's no struggle, there is no progress. Those who profess to favor freedom yet deprecate agitation are men and women who want crops without plowing the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the roar of its mighty waters. The struggle may be a moral one, or it may be a physical one, or it may be both moral and physical, but it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has, and it never will. Frederick Douglass. So on that note, um, we can now move to some questions. I thank you very, very much. <laughs> Frederick Douglass, okay, the comment was he was not an, okay, well this, um, what I have here says it, well, he was a freed slave. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah. Douglass was in Ireland is the comment. Yeah. Uh, by the way, I should also mention that besides uh, Global Discontent, there's a book I did with Chomsky on propaganda that reflects a lot of the things I've been talking about uh, tonight as, an, as addition to this new one. And then there's an Edward Said book there about the Middle East, which I did 20 years ago, and it hasn't missed a beat. 
because the situation has uh, actually gotten worse with now 600,000 colonists living in these colonies on occupied uh, Palestinian land. Last year was the 50th anniversary of the longest occupation of modern times, barely covered. It was the 100th anniversary of the Balfour Declaration, which was what the British Empire decided to use as its enabling uh, document uh, for uh, Zionism and, and uh, to create a, a state for the Jewish people in Palestine at the expense of the indigenous population who were barely referred to uh, in the uh, Balfour Declaration. Lots of anniversaries came and went. It was the 100th anniversary in 2016 of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, which really demarcated the, the imperial lines which define the modern Middle East, which has contributed enormously to the uh, conflicts in that region. You know, so how Syria and Lebanon, Jordan, uh, Iraq, all of these were you know, sliced and diced by the imperial powers, as they did in uh, Pakistan uh, and Afghanistan with the Durand Line in uh, 1893. The weight of imperialism on the world and and how it has informed a lot of these uh, problems would go, an understanding of that would go a long way into uh, proposing some kinds of solutions. But as long as we're ignorant of the past, basically we're, we're, we're easy um, pickings for uh, you know, the powers that want to perpetuate the, uh, the ideology of uh, conquest. What is the difference between the past what is the difference between the past and the present? Well, I think it's one of uh, degree. Uh, we have seen, uh, not just in the United States, but around the world, uh, right-wing right -wing leaders coming to power through the ballot box. Uh, that's what's very, very different uh, from the past. These are not, you know, this is not Mussolini marching on Rome in 1922 and seizing power. By the way, Mussolini founded the first fascist party uh, in 1915, and he jailed Antonio Gramsci uh, for many, many years because he was an outspoken uh, leftist. So uh, if you look around the world, look at, look at Erdogan in Turkey, look at um, Sebastian Kurz in uh, Austria, Look at uh, Zeman in the Czech Republic, who was just elected uh, last week. Look at Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, Andres Duda in uh, Poland. In state after state, Duterte uh, in the Philippines, Sisi in Egypt, they have all come to power through the ballot box, through, um, through using weapons of mass distraction, using uh, propaganda, and playing upon fear uh, and xenophobia to uh, generate uh, political support. So in almost all those cases, and even in La France, you know, we're all the home of uh, democracy and, and all of that, uh, Marine Le Pen got three times as many votes uh, as her father ever did. I mean, she was defeated in the election, but she got uh, almost a third of the vote uh, in France. So this is a worldwide uh, phenomenon right now where uh, the right is in ascendance, and the question has to be, why? So it's not just the, the techniques of propaganda, it has to do with the failure of neoliberalism, with its you know, bold promises of economic equality and uh, uh, democracy and expansion of freedom. Uh, we've had, particularly in the United States, but in all of these countries that I've mentioned, uh, severe uh, economic crises, a soaring inequality, greater concentration of wealth uh, as to levels never seen before. I mean, uh, Justice, Supreme Court Justice uh, Louis Brandeis said uh, decades ago that you can have two things. You can have one of two things. You can either have great concentrations of wealth or you can have democracy, but you can't have both. And so we have, you know, increasingly uh, democracy is being uh, undermined, but it's also being manipulated to allow these leaders to come to power through uh, the ballot box. Uh, there are others. There's a right winger in in Holland. I think it's, uh, there's uh, Geert Wilders in Holland. Uh, there's one in Switzerland as well. All of these, in, you know, in the wake of the collapse of the failure of uh, neoliberalism. So I, I think that's 
that is a huge difference. And I remember speaking in Canada in the spring of 2016, and uh, I didn't think uh, Trump said his name. I didn't think he would win, but I was telling audiences there, no matter what, 60 million people are going to vote for this guy. In fact, it was 62 million that ended up voting for him. So that tells you also a lot about our culture, our understanding of uh, politics and, and, and what's, what's going on. I mean, that's a pretty frightening thought. Yes? Well, this kind of question always makes me nervous. It's a, it's a question about um, whether I have a political vision uh, and what, what, what would constitute, uh, you know, positive uh, change. Would it be uh, supporting someone like uh, Elizabeth Warren or uh, Bernie Sanders? Um, I was a Sanders supporter uh, in 2016 for whatever that uh, was worth. Uh, there are major problems with the Democratic Party. Uh, I think Chris Hedges has you know, spoken about this extensively. Uh, you know, time and time again, uh, progressives have been sold out by the Democratic Party, but this is, you know, the system that we're in, you know, kind of locks us into this uh, two-party state, which is, you know, I think we, we need a parliamentary, a parliamentary democracy, which allows then for other parties to participate in the political process. So this winner-take-all system uh, inherently uh, favors the two major parties or the two business parties, as Chomsky calls them. One is pro-business and one is extremely pro-business, okay? So, <laughs> so you, have, you, you, know, you have your choice, you know, you can have arsenic or cyanide, uh, you know, it's a good choice, you know, arsenic, you could live a few months, you might be in a lot of pain, cyanide, you'll die right away. So, you know, that's often how I feel uh, when I go into the uh, voting booth, you know, but, um, Speaking of, you know, again, the system, why aren't the Democrats who have lost two of the last five elections because of the Electoral College not saying a word about it? Where is Nancy Pelosi and, and Chuck Schumer on abolishing the Electoral College? It is undemocratic. I mean, I go to primitive countries like Jordan and Armenia. I was recently there in both those countries, and they don't understand, you know, again, they're very backward. One candidate gets, gets more votes than another candidate, but doesn't win. Uh, please, you know, translate, please explain this, you know, antediluvian uh, system uh, that we have. Uh, super delegates are outrageous and uh, have been used as a tool by the two parties, but in the last round, in particular, uh, the Democrats, uh, you know, you know, rigged the election, rigged the primaries against uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, who I'm convinced would have won the presidential uh, can uh, election handily. Why? Because, you know, here's this man who can, you know, from Brooklyn who has ideas and can, can often ask for water. Um, because he was able to articulate the class issues, not issues, other issues which I'd like to see more of, you know, gender uh, and race to some extent, but class issues in particular, he would have wiped the floor with his opponent. But the Democrat, the national Democratic leadership was afraid of someone like uh, Bernie Sanders and worked, you know, overtime to make sure he didn't get the nomination with the, you know, the leadership. That's all come out now. It's, it's you know, very well uh, documented. But, you know, on the other hand, and this is the, on the, uh, this hand, the other hand, elections have consequences. Now we have Neil Gorsuch in the White House, in, in the, on the Supreme Court. Well, that might have been a slightly better outcome, actually. Uh, but he's on the Supreme Court with more to follow. I mean, this is, this is an area where the, present occupant is really doing serious damage. He's doing serious damage, irreparable damage to the, to the earth, to the ecology, but also in appointing um, you know, extreme uh, judges to various uh, federal uh, judgeships. So elections uh, do matter. We cannot simply say you know, we're above the clouds and you know, 
our caca doesn't smell, but it does. <laughs> so, you know, we, they do have consequences. It's, such a, it's a choice that one makes, yes? Okay, the question is, uh, how do I manage uh, dealing with so much information and how do I know so much? Actually, I feel I know very little, you know, compared to someone like uh, Chomsky. So for me, uh, one of the things that keeps me young is constantly learning. You know, I'm very curious about the world. I'm very interested uh, in people and ideas and that. And then connecting with people like you, you know, with listeners, you know, with, with uh, individuals that have, you know, been writing to me or call me uh, in Boulder and talk to me. Uh, that invigorates me. It gives me a lot of energy. And, you know, I feel very privileged to do what I'm doing. And, uh, you know, I feel uniquely positioned uh, to be doing uh, this, this kind of work. But, you know, I don't, I don't want to exaggerate, uh, you know, my influence or that, you know, I have any particular... Uh, kind of genius. It's just a question of hard work. You know, I was very influenced by growing up in, you know, after um, the genocide of the Armenians and my family being involved in that and the Turkish denial of the history. So that got me interested into politics and history and how that continues to, to this day. Uh, and I think I've, discovering new things is very exciting and meeting people is, you know, I'm, I'm going to Grace Harbor tonight and I'm speaking there tomorrow, you know, in Aberdeen, Washington. You know, who would have thought a kid from the east side of New York would be speaking in Aberdeen? At the, at the, at there's a college and an, uh, there's a community radio station there. There's a, um, a college as well. They have a speaker series. Uh, and then I'm going to uh, Vancouver uh, to speak on Friday and Saturday. So this kind of, you know, traveling also keeps me uh, very young, even though I have to deal with the TSA the thousands standing around, that's what TSA stands for. Actually, speaking about uh, Iran, I went to Iran last year, and uh, every time I've returned to the United States, I've been held for a secondary questioning. You know, why did you go? Same thing, every, you know, it's just harassment, because, you know, Iran is, a, again, a great threat to all of you, so we should all be shaking. So why did you go? Who did you meet? Where did you stay? You know terribly boring questions by people who are clearly disinterested uh, in you and your answers, but are waiting for you to fall into a trap. So um, I talked to an law immigration lawyer about this, and he said that's the game they play. You know, they're waiting for you to say, oh, you stayed at this hotel on this occasion, and then, but the last time you came through from uh, Europe, you said you stayed at this hotel. So you, I've caught you in a lie. So it's, it's a kind of game they play with them. Um, you know, w with us. But again, it shows you the harassment and the normalization of surveillance. The normalization, I mean, you know, the, the Republican Party used to be famous for a couple of things. One was uh, fiscal austerity, you know, balancing the budgets. Now it's about, you know, blowing holes through the budget with massive deficits. And the other was the, uh, you know, kind of the principle of uh, non-intervention in, into your private life. Uh, Non-surveillance, government snooping, it's, all the hinges have come off, off those doors. There's massive amounts of uh, surveillance. We live in a surveillance uh, society. Glenn Greenwald has you know, written about this ex uh, extensively. Uh, if you want to know about a good positive media outlet, The Intercept, uh, which Glenn Greenwald uh, started with uh, Jeremy Scahill, Murtaza Hussein, uh, other wonderful uh, writers. Um, very good information uh, on the intercept. The question is about uh, Russian interference in the 2016 uh, election, and I assume ongoing uh, Russian attempts to influence political discourse uh, here in uh, the United States. I would like to see all countries refrain from interfering in uh, elections of other countries. You know, I, I just gave a lecture on Latin America and was talking about uh, Honduras and the interference there uh, and actually overthrowing a democratically elected government of um, Zelaya in 2009. Uh, and that continues to this day with interference in uh, that particular 
uh, elections. So uh, the U.S. itself has a long history of interfering and manipulating uh, other elections. If, in fact, it starts right out of the gate when the, Brit when the U.S. takes over the imperial mantle at the end of World War II. The French and the, and the Italian communist and the Greek communist parties were very, very strong and in a position to win elections in all of those countries. Why were they strong? Because they were the core of the anti-fascist, anti-Nazi resistance. They had huge popularity and prestige with the general population. And then, of course, the U.S., because of its Cold War hysteria and anti-Soviet you know, kind of... Um, uh, fixation, um, manipulated those elections, you know, convinced people, you know, you won't be able to go to church, you'll have to learn Russian, the same kind of stuff they did in Guatemala in 1954, overthrowing a democratically elected government, or the year before in 1953 with Mohammed Mossadegh in, uh, in Iran, uh, manipulating elections, uh, the U.S. stands second to none. So, um, you know, I think there's been a lot of attention to um, Russian uh, interference, uh, do I doubt it? Uh, you know, I don't have any inside information, but it, it seems that it's it's fairly well uh, corroborated. But and were people influenced? Well, we know people are influenced by uh, fake news. Uh, in fact. My wife was a victim of fake news just a couple of days ago. She said, you know what, Sylvester, Sylvester Stallone just died. Uh, and this went out on the internet, and it was completely false. But far more serious than that was a report that a, a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., Comet Pizza, uh, was part of a... Um, kind of underground network that Hillary Clinton was using where they were trafficking and children and pedophilia. Well, you know, somebody saw that and picked up a gun in North Carolina, because, you know, we're a free country here and the NRA rules, uh, and goes to Washington, D.C., and, you know, is, is about to shoot people because he read that report about what was going on at this pizza parlor. Totally uh, fictitious. Again, you know, very, very uh, dangerous. So um, what's going to come of this? I'm not, I'm not quite sure where this investigation uh, is leading in, in terms uh, that people have committed perjury, I think is very well established. Uh, are they, you know, one of the things we have to thank the great leader for uh, is that, you know, words like collusion and misogyny and patriarchy and a white supremacy. I used to have to explain these words to audiences, <laughs> but now, oh, yeah, I get you. I know what you mean. Yeah, and uh, and what's that other term from the Constitution? Uh, emoluments, emoluments. Yeah, I can't even pronounce it. Yeah, you know, making money because you're in a position of power. Just as the great leader's son is now in New Delhi, you know, talking to a foreign, you know capitalist interest in that country, in the Indian capitalist there, uh, you know, trafficking on the name of his father. Uh, you know, a clear conflict of interest. I mean, this is, you know, it makes the days of the robber barons look like, you know, pristine uh, kind of examples of, of uh, you know, decency and honesty. So it's, it's, it's a, it's, I don't have some deep insight uh, into this except stay tuned and let's see what happens. Yes, and then. Yeah. What are your thoughts on impeachment in terms of what it would do to this country? Uh, what are my thoughts on impeachment and in terms of what it would do to this country? I think right now to be talking about it is unrealistic. Uh, you know, unless there's a major change in control of Congress uh, as a result of the November election, uh, that's not even. Uh, a possibility. Uh, what could happen, again, it, we're speculating. The Mueller report can have some real bombshells inside of it of collusion, of not just perjury. The difficult thing with collusion is to determine intent. You know, I intended this to happen. It was my, a conscious, premeditated idea, or that it just happened. So it's, it's, in legal terms, it may be difficult to, um, to prove uh, what, what, is, what impact would 
uh, it have on the country. I don't think it would reach that point because I think the the senior Republican leadership will throw him under the bus. They're, they'd be much more comfortable with someone like Pence uh, sitting in the White House than they are. You can see their discomfort. You know, they're not they're not happy campers. They're riding this tiger, but the tiger, you know. It's, it's very difficult to control the, uh, the tiger. Uh, might it have a deleterious effect on the political uh, economy? It could be very cleansing. It could be um, you know, a possibility of a real move. But unless there's institutional changes, uh, these kinds of issues are going to continue to come up with greater and greater frequency, I'm afraid. So the question is about, uh, essentially, uh, the question that comes up at every single meeting I address, which is actually the wrong question, because the question is always, what can I do? Yeah. It has to be pluralistic. It, it has to be, what can we do as a community? Once, once they've isolated us and they've got us thinking about, you know, you're just alone, there's no one else, you're atomized, get back to your phone, get back online, get on your Facebook account, tell us what you did today, uh, the game is over. Um, I would just say, um, you know, I don't know enough about local organizations to say do this, do that, but find something you're comfortable with and put energy into that. You know, we, it might be Code Pink. It might be an environmental organization like 350.org. It may be organizations that are here uh, in your community that I certainly don't know the names of that, and I'm sure it, uh, exist. It's, it's important that you, I think, just a word of advice, that you feel authentic in doing it. Uh, that you're not, say, hey, David told me do this, so I'm doing it. No. You know, we, we can't have that robot, robotic type of uh, response. It has to be something you feel genuine about uh, doing, be it education, be it getting involved in, you know, producing a podcast, uh, writing articles for, you know, blogs or for, um, you know, the local papers and, and, and the like. Yes, you had a follow-up question? Where do I see the biggest opening? I think it's the environment. The environment. Yes, because of those the issues that I mentioned earlier about clean air, clean water, nutritious food, healthy, maintained uh, parks. You know, a couple of days ago, believe it or not, in Boulder it was like 75 degrees, and I was hiking on this magnificent, well-maintained trail. People worked on that to keep that trail uh, well maintained, and I'm very grateful. Uh, you know that it's there. So you know, finding something uh, that you feel good about doing, and finding kindred spirits, you know, allies. You know, that's how movements grow. You know, everyone thinks, oh, it was Rosa Parks all by herself. You know, she decided not to sit in the back of the bus on December first, nineteen fifty-five. In fact, she was part of a network. Uh, she was part of a community. She had studied nonviolence and civil disobedience at the Highlander Center in Tennessee. Uh, she was the general secretary of the NAACP in Montgomery. This was a very accomplished woman, ideologically and you know uh, politically. So it's because she, there were people behind her. We know about Martin Luther King Jr. And I, and, uh, as I mentioned, but behind him was this huge mass movement. Uh, where he, you know, he became the articulate spokesman of. But it's always about movements. It's all about community, finding common, common ground and kindred spirits. Uh, the question is, you know, essentially boils down to, can we depend on the Democratic Party to carry out you know, decent economic policies and non-interventionist imperial, uh, imperialistic policies? Or do we have to create some kind of uh, alternative? I would say we have to have an inside-outside strategy. Uh, that's something I learned from um, Manning Marable, great African-American uh, scholar who taught at University of Colorado at Boulder and later at Columbia. He said, you try and work within uh, to get you know, positions, but also create at the same time a parallel organizations, which can be genuine uh, alternatives. Uh, right now, the leadership of the party, as represented by Schumer and Pelosi, are old news. You know, they should step aside and, first of all, give younger people uh, an opportunity 
uh, to develop, you know, political skills and, and have those important uh, leadership uh, positions. Uh, will they turn on uh, capitalism? No, I think they'll be FDR type capitalists, you know, kind or better capitalism, but they're not ready to, you know, embrace uh, socialism at this point. Uh, so I think, you know, we need to continue advancing uh, those kinds of ideas about uh, collective action. And by the way, the climate change crisis can only be solved collectively. There's no two ways about it. It doesn't matter what, you know, I, the Ivory Coast or Benin or Malaysia, if they have the greatest, you know, environmental policy. This has to be done globally. And that has to be, and the vehicle for that is the United Nations. So, um, you know, to get back to, um, you know, the Democratic Party, I make this joke. We need a second party, you know, one that will fight and defend the rights of the people and the rights of Mother Nature. Look at Bolivia. Look at Evo Morales. Uh, uh, look at his speech at the UN in September of 2017 and compare that with the speech that our great leader gave. You'll see such um, a lack of uh, vision on one hand and, and tremendous engagement and, and humanity uh, on the other. And the, Brazil and the B Bolivian parliament actually passed a rights of nature. I mean, it doesn't have, I mean, it's, it's symbolic, it's important. A rights of nature law, that nature has certain rights not to be uh, violated. You know, this could be a stepping stone to something uh, much wider. But neoliberalism has brought us to this position where you have a range of right-wing leaders in countries that I've mentioned as well as in this country. Racism in America, is it increasing or decreasing? Well, it's interesting that, you know, we're in Black History Month and today's the anniversary of the assassination of uh, uh, Malcolm X and the possible alliance of Ma Martin Luther King Jr. and M Malcolm X, which was evolving, by the way, was a huge threat to the establishment and certainly uh, was, you know, perhaps, I think, behind the assassinations of both of those uh, two leaders. Uh, I think racism is now more out in the open. Uh, it's always been there, uh, uh, but we have an enabler uh, in the White House that has given it legitimacy, that has given it oxygen. And so, you know, there are many more instances of uh, racist attacks, incidentally, attacks on Jewish people, which is rampant. And it's really surprising that the great leader who has an Orthodox uh, son-in-law and an Orthodox uh, daughter uh, has nothing to say about the outrageous things that are on websites such as a tablet, you know, the worst kind of um, anti-Jewish uh, fear-mongering uh, that you know you would have seen in Der Strumel is now on alt-right and tablet and other uh, right-wing sources. There's certainly um, more reporting on incidents as well, but uh, again, I think we're at a very dangerous moment uh, where the forces of xenophobia and racism and nativism, always present in the American soil, has now been enabled uh, by this particular uh, leader. Yeah, the question is about, uh, about the economy and economic change, and a reference was made to an organization that I know nothing about, uh, and um, FDR, who basically saved capitalism. Uh, it's interesting as a, yeah. at a as a patriarch, as a blue blood from the Hudson Valley in New York, uh, he he was uh, hated by his uh, own class because they saw him as a traitor. And uh, I remember in one speech he said, um, "I welcome their hatred." He he embraced it, but you know he was he he saw the economic crisis and was able to do certain things to um, elite certain decent things that we still have today, like Social Security, like unemployment insurance, like you know um, the Civilian Conservation Corps and all of these New Deal agencies. Uh, the uh, Glass-Steagall Act was passed then, uh, or the Wagner Act, which allowed for the first time for unions to organize in, in 1935. Uh, that too has been, you know, 
deeply eroded. One of the reasons our country is the way it is today with rampant inequality is because of the attack and destruction of the organized labor of, of the union movement. So, you know, we've gone from almost 40% of the workforce being organized to single digits. And this has, you know, in, it has given the bosses tremendous leverage over workers. And they're able to pick off workers one by one because there isn't, you know, the union. There was solidarity. You know, there was a notion that an injury to one is an injury to all. And now because of right-wing propaganda, it's become an injury to one is an injury to one. You're on your own. You know, there is no community. Uh, what did Margaret Thatcher say? You know, there is no society. You know, you're all individuals. There is no collectivity. Well, I have to say that there is and there is, you know, we should be working toward uh, economic justice. And if, if you want to read a radical document, actually, FDR's 1944 uh, inauguration speech where he, lay, he lays out the econo an economic uh, bill of rights. It's quite a radical uh, program. Uh, about economics, there's an excellent magazine called Dollars and Cents. Uh, it's produced by a radical group of economists, of which Richard Wolff was just one, but many others, at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst. It's called Dollars and Cents, and the cents is spelled S-E-N-S-E. -E. So um, again, I want you to uh, support this bookstore, support Alternative Radio, get some CDs, get some books. I'll see you back at the table. Thank you very much.